Nothing can quiet a crowd better than a big dragon. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. I'm Brian Grigsby. I'm the president of Moravian College, and I welcome you to um, our first lecture series this year. Um, I will have Michael Kaur come out and welcome our, our speaker. I'm not going to take any of his um, energy away from that, but on behalf of the trustees, the faculty and the students and the staff at Moravian College, I welcome you to the sixth oldest college, the first to educate women in the country, a place that's a little revolutionary, so we're happy to have HBO here because they are always on the cutting edge. And with that, I'd like to introduce Michael Kaur, our Director of Marketing and Communications. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, thank you, this is great. We're so excited to have Casey Bloys here. Uh, when I saw Casey last year at Thanksgiving, I, an idea popped into my head. I had just started at Moravian last November as the Director of Marketing and Communications, and I saw Casey and an idea popped into my head. I said, I'm at Moravian, wouldn't it be kind of cool if you came to speak? And he did not hesitate and said, all right, let's do it. So it's been a, a back and forth with his schedule since probably January to find a date, and we're so excited to have him here. Um, so I'd like to welcome Casey Bloys here, and he's going to be sharing the stage with uh, Joel Nathan Rosen, the director of our Media and Communication Studies program. So everybody, give a hand for Casey Bloys and Joel Nathan Rosen. Nice crowd tonight. We, we, we got the nice weather for you. We know it doesn't rain enough for <laughs> you in you. Southern yes, California, so we it. figured we'd, we'd do you a solid on that. Welcome. Is, have you been to Moravian before? Uh, I don't think I have. You know, I'm sitting here doing the math, and I'm thinking, you and Dwayne Johnson, Taylor Swift from nearby, and I can never remember her name, but um, Ben Stiller's wife, I know, is from West Coastville. And Daniel Day Kim was also a Freedom High School There we man. go. There yeah. we go. So, this isn't Hollywood. This isn't, you know, this isn't something, you know, out outrageously elegant. Tell us about how the talent grows around here. <laughs> well, I think clearly Freedom High School is a rigorous oh, okay. academic institution. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I, it is, I will say it is strange that myself, Dwayne Johnson, and Daniel Day Kim from Freedom High School, it's an odd pair, it's an odd pairing. I, I'm not but quite still, sure. But statistically, you know. St yeah, right. you know, it's interesting. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just curious, I'm sure everybody else out here is as well. How do you get started in film? Or how do you get started in, in your case, television film? Um, well, the way, what I figured out, I moved to Los Angeles uh, almost 21 years ago, and I had always wanted to work in television. Uh, specifically TV, not film. I watched a lot of TV as a kid, mm -hmm. um, and, but I did not really understand the television business or how it worked. Um, and when I moved, to, I moved to LA for a job in marketing at Paramount. That got me out there. And what I figured out was, you, it, it's almost like an apprenticeship system. You get a job as an assistant to somebody. Mm -hmm. You answer the mm -hmm. phones and you know, do whatever your boss wants you to do. And so right. that's. That's the first job I got. I was an right. assistant to a woman who was uh, director of current uh, programming at CBS, and I was her assistant. So I, I, had, nice. I went from being an executive at Paramount to answering this woman's phone and getting her egg white omelets. <laughs> but it was actually, you know, I was so happy to be there, I didn't really mind. Um, right. And then it, you really do just work your way up. It's a little bit like a, a triangle, like a pyramid scheme, mm -hmm. a lot at the bottom, and you just kind of Game of Thrones style, keep right. going until you get right. to the end, right. you know? Well, so yeah, so the, the, there's, a, there's a question there about glamour then, because what you're describing, fetching omelets and, you know, opening mail and hoping, you know, it's not hate mail, whatever, yeah. um, there's nothing glamorous about that. No, right? no. Is, is this something, that, does, it, does it take away, you go out there all full of, you know, all full of fire and... and I, you know, I think with everything, it's just the context. Like, I, wa I so wanted to be there that mm -hmm. I was happy to do whatever she wanted me to do. I mean, I think whenever people ask about advice in any job, I kind of say, you know, people know if you want to be there or not. It mm -hmm. doesn't matter what business you're in. Uh, if someone is excited to be there and happy to be there, you can tell. Okay. And if someone is 
has a bad attitude or is not into it, you know, it, it shows. So I right. was, you know, I wanted to be there. So it took me a lot to get there also. Right. You know, so. Was there ever any talk, any, anything in your mind about being on the other side of the camera? Like an actor? Like an actor. No, no. <laughs> or scenery, it could have no, been scenery. Never, no, I never had that bug. When, I will tell you, when you find out someone was an actor, you, you usually go, oh yeah, it makes sense. You know, there's a certain type of person who's an actor. It was not for me. Okay, okay. Well, I wanted to, there was a question posed to me that I want to put out there, you know, fairly early here. And I'm sure most people in the audience have wondered this themselves. What really happened to Tony Soprano? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I actually don't know. I think it is an interesting, I think for a, finales are tough. You know, if, uh, if you think about, well, Six Feet Under was a pretty good finale, but if you think about Seinfeld, if you think about Sopranos, um, if you think about Breaking Bad, everybody has an opinion on how a show should end right. and the right way. Or if it should end. And if it should, if end, it should end, should end and how it should end. Um, <laughs> But I, I mean, the, the thing that was interesting about The Sopranos is it did make you think, you know, uh, in a way everybody got their own version of it. You know, I, I, I think he was probably shot, but I don't think David has ever really told anybody what his, uh, what really happened in his mind. But I think that's his point is it can be whatever you think it should be as a fan. It must have been a fascinating conversation back, you know, back in the offices. You know, I have this idea, I want to just end the show I'm not sure. Now, I, my boss at the time, Carolyn Strauss, was the head of programming, and she dealt with David. I don't know that he pitched it specifically. Uh, at that point, I would guess he had free reign to do whatever mm -hmm. he was going to do. So right. I, I don't know how much HBO knew beforehand. Um, typically, like I know in Game of Thrones, uh, the ending, they're going to shoot multiple versions so that nobody really knows what happens, you have to do that on, on a show. Um, right. Because, you know, if crew is shooting something, people know. So they're gonna shoot multiple versions so that there's no real definitive answer until the end. Interesting, and then you can, uh, you can sell the rest on a bonus. On a bonus <laughs> yes, guess, it, would right? be, yeah, it would be good extra point. content. Well, yeah, and you mentioned that, okay, so, you know, obviously there are some Game of Thrones fans here, and I, I believe this is the last season. Coming up will be Coming the last up, season. Yeah. Right. By the way, the numbers are, have been staggering. Yes. I didn't know there were that many television viewers in the country. <laughs> well, what's interesting, I, I think there's about, I'm gonna get these numbers wrong, but I wanna say, let's uh, say like 150 million viewers, TV viewers. HBO is only in about 30, maybe we're in 32, 33 million homes total. So we're, we're in a third of t the total TV universe. Mm. Game of Thrones is cuming up to about 30 million viewers per episode. That's almost our entire subscriber base. That, wow. that is kind of unbelievable. That's extraordinary. And, and you're, speaking of, with, with the subscriber base, that sort of brings up an interesting question as well. Um, obviously, we're in an age of Amazon Prime and Netflix and whatnot, and, and HBO Go, I have to assume, was, was your way of keeping, you know, mm -hmm. keeping up with that particular, those particular moves. Um, are you able to track viewership that is, you know, watching live versus oh, yeah. logging into HBO Go? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the percentage of people who watch on Sunday, Game of Thrones is, is a unique example because a lot of people actually do watch on Sunday night, but typically speaking, an average HBO show, the percentage of people who watch it, not on Sunday, but either on demand or, um, on platforms, you know, multiple airings, or on HBO Go or now, I, I think it's about 70% of viewing takes place off of Sunday night, mm -hmm. and that number continues to grow as on on demand has become uh, more sophisticated as cable systems have have uh, grown in capacity, mm -hmm. and HBO Go and now. So the the percentage of people who watch HBO not on Sunday night at nine o'clock or ten o'clock every year gets larger. Right. And of course, there's always TiVoing and other yeah. DVRs. Um, Sunday night, that's, that brings up a, an interesting image too. It was pretty common that back in the day, uh, the, new, the new movies were premiered on Saturday night. Mm -hmm. Saturday night, I, sit, I understand that you still do premiere you know, the new, new films and all that, but it doesn't seem to be as commercially successful. The theatrical films? Night. Yeah, theatrical films. Actually, what's interesting is most of the media attention for HBO is on the original series, mm -hmm. but there is a, a statistic that I will get wrong. I want to say 
half of our subscribers have never seen one of our original shows. They get it specifically for the first run features. We have better, really? we have better films than any other streaming service because we have uh, first run films from three and a half studios. Um, so a lot of people still get HBO just for the movies. Really? Yeah. Well, I, and it was, I did some, I did a little research before I came here. In fact, I have it written down right here. Um, at three o'clock this afternoon. Uh oh. Talk a little bit about <laughs> what ver versatility of, yes. of, of the airways. Um, at three o'clock this afternoon, this was the lineup on all what are the six bands plus. Um, Depends on the cable. Spanish speaking, system. right? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, there were six. Uh, I'm sorry. There were six. One of which was a duplicate in Spanish. Uh, it was Real Sports, uh, The Girl with the Pearl Earring, mm -hmm. Kinsey, mm -hmm. Hellboy Two. I'm going to have to assign in my class. Um, and Spring Breakdown with Rachel Poehler. Now, we are talking about a wide range of right. artistic endeavor. Right. Well, a lot of that, again, we, ha we have deals with Warner Brothers, Universal, Summit. I can't remember. I can't remember what the other series. But so we basically get their output. Um, so it's, it's not, in other words, when you make the, the deals for uh, studio output, you don't choose which movies you get their, you get their lineup. So um, you get everything, good and bad. Well, and that's interesting that you would say that, that your numbers suggest that there's still, people are still subscribing for the theatrical releases. Mm -hmm. When I think, when we come, we go back and we come and look back at this period, you know, starting with, uh, we talked about this a little bit back, backstage, starting with Oz, uh, I want to say 1994 maybe, 93, mm -hmm. 94, um, and then sort of inching slowly with, with really popular but term limited programs such as The Wire um, and uh, um, certainly Breaking Bad that you mentioned as well, another network so we won't talk too much about Breaking Bad. Um, but we, we're starting to see a, a, a genuine shift in, um, in the art, first of all, in the artistic value of mm -hmm. television programming. I mean, it's soup to nuts from Gilligan's Island, let's, mm -hmm. let's be honest there. Um, but in, in other ways, we're starting to see something that I never thought I'd see in my lifetime, which is, you know, big time movie talent mm -hmm. actually wanting to do television. Mm -hmm. Now, walk us through that, you know, from, a, from, from the other side, from inside the television as opposed to, you know, what we see on the screen. The, the migration? Well, the migration and, well, and just the, the, the move toward the series as opposed to Well, the I think well, what's happening is a couple of things is the, the movie industry really is imploding. Uh, basically, you have either tentpole comic book movies like X-Men or Superman or whatever, and you have very small indie films and the entire kind of adult oriented, I don't mean triple X, I mean adult, you know, contemporary right, adult right. films, uh, in the middle, um, they're, they're gone. Mm -hmm. So they, I, they've been supplanted by TV series, and mm -hmm. I think a couple of reasons. Um, uh, I, I think what people are realizing when you look at a show like Soprano, I, Sopranos really did start this, a really kind of rich storytelling over the course of 10 hours that it was possible to do that at a level of theatrical release, people started to realize, well, why limit yourself to two hours? Mm -hmm. You know, um, th there's no reason that you should contain yourself there. So what, what became kind of in a crowded marketplace, it's much easier to sell a comic book franchise than a more nuanced, you know, uh, adult show like Breaking Bad or The Wire or, you know, we have the, the Deuce coming up. Um, the storytelling, the, the, uh, the strengths of storytelling in television became apparent to people. And I, I do think what, in 2007, I think it was the combination of the iPhone that was introduced mm -hmm. and broadband became <laughs> available in a certain percentage of home that it, it kind of became a critical mass. And I think people started to stay home from the movies. Now, when people ask me questions about Netflix, they usually assume that Netflix success or Amazon or whatever streaming is at our expense, mm. but it, it hasn't been at our expense, and we can get into how well we're doing. Um, but and we will. Yeah, uh, we can get into that. But it's it's really been at the expense of it, Netflix. Uh, Reed Hastings, who's run it, who runs Netflix, has said um, he's in a war for people's time, mm -hmm. and I think where you're seeing the. Um, that eroded is people going to the movies. 
it, the, the quality of television and the uh, ease with which you can watch television anytime you want, you know, whatever you want, I think is what's impacting ticket sales to theaters because if it's easier to watch at home, why, why go out? The yeah, quality of the yeah. picture has gotten to a level, the quality of the picture, the quality of the programming. And has the now, size of the picture too. And the size of the picture, yeah. depending, yeah. has gotten to a level where that decision to you know, stay home and watch a small TV with you know, shitty programming or going to the movies, that, that uh, equation has, has shifted and I think in television's favor. I would think that there's another aspect of this too, which is you know, when, you're, when you're watching a two hour film and we know that two and a half hours has now become verboten in, in most, movie, uh, most houses, um, the two hour film is very limited in terms of character development. Absolutely. And, and that, that's why comic book franchises are, are, are well suited to two hours. Right. Because you can, you can see the twists and turns and, and the graphic. The and it's about explosions, explosions and, and, and right, right. effects and things yeah. like that. And I think that was the, the first time I, I, I started to notice how really rich television series could be is when you know, HBO started airing, and I, I'd say I go back to Oz and, and, and some of those early attempts, um, and certainly The Wire was, you know, mm -hmm. very, it was, and of course it's well written, it's David Simon's work, it's, you know, exemplary. Um, but it, it's, it is certainly noticeable that you could spend an entire season getting to know the primary characters, where as in a movie, it, it's, it's all but impossible. Yeah. And I think, I think that certainly appeals to a larger segment of the population than, than many would imagine. Mm -hmm. um, so w which sort of begs the question, how much does the intelligence of the audience factor into your programming? In other words, are you are you starting to think more along the lines of our viewers are a hell of a lot smarter than most people give them credit? Well, I think we always have. That, that's what has set HBO apart, is um, the kinds of storytelling that, that our showrunners uh, do requires, assumes an, uh, intelligence on the part of the viewer. Um, that, you know, a, a part of that is because, not that it's, it's not a commercial endeavor because people are paying, but I think when you remove advertising from mm. the uh, picture, which we did a long time ago, it does change the tenor of both the business and the storytelling. Mm -hmm. So it feels a little bit more pure. So I think there's, from the beginning, there's always been the assumption that our audience will catch up or will understand or will understand nuance. And when you're dealing with a broadcast show, you know, our shows, an hour is, an hour show runs 56, 57 minutes. An hour program on uh, broadcast television is 44 minutes. That's a lot of story, right. you know, it's a big difference in terms of the story. Um, so we just allow the artists to kind of tell the story they want to tell, not ask them, we don't ask them to explain it outright, we don't ask them to regurgitate things. They, they, they write it the way they feel it should be written. I think. Part of the problem that you have in network television is a system of they make the assumption that their viewers are stupid because they're broadcasters and they want to appeal it to as many people as possible. And I think that kind of dumbed, dumbs down the product. And we've always had the luxury of not having to do that. And I think one of the things that HBO does that I really appreciate as well is you don't give us and yesterday on as the stomach turns, we because you assume the people who are, who are viewing have that sometimes seen that. On, on sometimes they'll they'll have a little bit of a catch up, but it's again, like with everything we do, it's more subtle than than. And that's uh, that's typically it's typically I, my experience has been with seasonal breaks, long breaks. Yes. You yeah. know, um, and something you said about the comic book uh, universe as well on film that you're seeing a lot of that too. That's also another aspect of comic book films too is that they can be carried on to the next film that you're yes. building on to. It, it they really do feel like series, and I wonder. I wonder how much of this people like Brian Singer were thinking about when he, when he starts the X-Men franchise. I, I'm yeah. guessing that if X-Men started today, it would probably be pitched as a series. Probably, probably. But I, I'm, I'm thinking because Brian Singer did do some television. He, he has, yeah. Right, so there's, and you're, this like, it goes back to what we were saying earlier, that what we're seeing now in the industry is that television has, has not beginning, it has supplanted the films 
in, in terms of the sheer storytelling. Yeah. Now, granted, there's something, there's something still magical about going to a movie and for two hours you can be just lost and eating bad popcorn. But you know, when you have time to develop, suddenly you're, sorting to, you're having to follow along, and in some cases, like Boardwalk Empire, which is one of my favorites, you're actually having to go back and go, go review some of your American history yeah. from high yes. school, yeah. because some of that stuff is, is, is pretty heady stuff. Yeah. Now, it's, it, the thing with the, with the feature talent, like I said earlier, when I started, I specifically wanted to be in TV. And when I moved to Los Angeles 20 years ago, film was the, you know, that's where everybody wanted to work. And um, I was pretty clear about wanting to work in television, but it's been funny working in television this long and seeing that shift. I get probably a call once a week from a you know, high-end feature producer calling me saying, well, I just love TV. And I'm like, oh, really, do you? Really? Now, when did we're, that happen? We're a, we're a far cry from, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, one, one of your, uh, not your classmates, but an alma mater of your same um, institution, Northwestern, Newton Minow, when he was, uh, <laughs> you know, the chair of the FCC, called yes. television the vast wasteland. Yes, exactly. And I had, believe he had Gilgan's Island in mind when he said that. But, you know, I liked Gilgan's Island. What can I well, tell and, you? And I, would, I was going to assume that a lot of those shows were very influential yes, for you. Yeah. What else? I'm just curious. They, I, they don't have to hear it. I, um, I went through, uh, I, I'm amazed, now that I have kids who are, ten, I have ten and a half year old twins, now that I have kids, I am shocked at the amount of television that I was allowed to watch. But it was um, Gilligan's Island, Munsters, Jefferson's, Good Times, What's Happening, Family Ties, um, Bewitched, uh, Leave it to Beaver, uh, and then as I got into high school, LA Law, Hill Street Blues, St. Elsewhere. Um, so you graduated from the valedictorian fun pack to the more heady. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Was it Stephen Bot? Was it was Stephen Bot? Was L.A. Right, Law? Yeah. Right. Yeah. L.A. Law was a, was a wonderful show. Yeah. Yeah. But it, but as even then, right? That's the, the separation from the '80s into the '90s, and we start to see um, something different is coming along. And, and it's not just it's not just content and dialogue. It's things like lighting. The oh yeah. Lighting yeah. and scenery and, yeah. and just really incredible things happening. You know, and and particularly as well, let's face it, dialogue got a little bit headier as well. Yeah. So, yeah. so let's talk about some of the things we, we saw, a little video package of things that yes. have been. Let's talk about some of the things that are, are coming out in the next season. I know you, but you're here for a premiere tomorrow. Yes. Uh, tomorrow we have David Simon's new show called The Deuce. Um, it is about the birth of the pornography industry. Um, it's set in Times Square in 1971. Um, and David, you're a fan of The Wire, but for those of you who don't know, David has a very kind of, he takes a subject like, The Wire was a show basically about the death of an American city, Baltimore, and he kind of looked at it from a couple of different angles. This, he takes kind of a sociological look at the birth of pornography and the people who did it, who were involved in it, and um, he kind of humanizes the event. Um, and he has, he, he created it with a guy named George Pelicanos, who's a novelist, and David is a former journalist. So it's a very specific way of looking at television. Um, I, I think successfully, I think he looks at difficult concepts, humanizes them, and makes you, you know, think about pornography. You know, in my, pornography has been legal as, as long as I've been alive, mm -hmm. but when you watch something like The Deuce, you realize it really did start you know, in Times right. Square with, right. you know, hookers and prostitutes and pimps and the mafia. And where we're going in the series is, you know, David has this, th you know, the mafia ha started pornography and they lost this entire multi-billion dollar business to the West Coast. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're mm -hmm. kind of dumb. I mean, the, the mafia was kind of dumb in, in what, how they handled it. But it's just an interesting, you know, this is this pervasive force in our culture and I don't think anybody's ever really looked at it in, in a human way. And uh, I know Maggie Gyllenhaal, who uh, plays a hooker in it, had an interesting thing to say. We had a press conference about it, and the TV journalist asked us mm -hmm. about the show. And she said, "If I hope the show, there's sex in it, but it's, it is not glamorous sex. But she says, if you, if you watch it and it turns you on, I hope it makes you think about <laughs> what goes into the, 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 how people's lives are affected when they're making pornography. You're enjoying it. It just gives you an inside view of it. I so. think she says this in one of the trailers I, I've, I've seen that, or she makes reference to, you know, this, this, is, this is really hard work or something along those lines. Yeah. I think just before we see the package here, um, 
I think one of the things about Simon that I find really interesting is that not one of his characters are really, really likable or really, really worthy of our hate and scorn. They're just no, all, he, he they makes all have human. interesting little twists and turns to their dynamic. And, right, and just, just when you think, wow, this guy couldn't get any worse, he suddenly finds redemption there right. somewhere. So. Yeah. If you want to roll the table, it's it's two trailers. I think we have. Oh, oh, and the other one is a, a, co- is a show right? called Succession, yeah. which is a show about um, a media family, maybe the Murdochs, maybe the Redstones. Um, may I mean, and actually, there's you know, it's any kind of uh, powerful family, and as we all know, all families are somewhat dysfunctional. But in this case, this is a family that controls uh, pieces of the media. So it's a look at a New York family. Um, that is, uh, the father has decided that he doesn't want to retire and hand over his company to his kids. So I think the scene we have is the son being told that he's not going to take over his father's company. Forgive me, I've always wanted to do this. Roll tape. Working a story. About? Pimps, hookers. I'm trying to understand why these women are out there. When you figure that out, you let me know. I know love in the heart of the city. Hey, baby brother. No Still betting? Winning. See how long that lasts. Ain't no love. Who's your man? No man, just me. How's that work? You gotta work a little harder. You gotta be a little more careful. Scary world out here, babe. Go home. If you stay, you'll die. I'm not his mother. He needs you. I'm doing the best I can. I'm running a legitimate business here. I gotta work seven nights a week to make enough for me and my family. There's been a change in the law about community standards. What about community standards? Apparently, New York has none. There's going to be an opportunity coming your way. Once in a lifetime thing. All I can say is it's going to be good. What am I looking at? The future. When do we start? Water towers, trees, skyscrapers. Hey, 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 buddy. We ready to fuck or what? I'm really sorry, but it, it looks like there's an issue. Fuck, what the fuck? You want to bump the offer another point? Do you want to call your dad? Do I want to call my dad? No, I don't want to call my dad. Do you want to call your dad? How's it going? Yeah, I'm uh, right in the middle, dad. Did you close? Uh. Kids, can you give me two minutes? I got a speech. So, I've got some paperwork on the family trust, which will decide the situation. I'm gonna give it a couple of years. As chairman, CEO, head of the firm. This has been floated already. There's fucking paps outside. You fuck me. It's my fucking company. I'd love to get you back in. What's in it for me? Things are getting shaken up. I won the Tom Chubb. He's lost it. It's gonna blow the firm's credibility. I know that you've read a lot of books about business management and this and that, but you know what? Sometimes it is a big dick competition. Great, it was great. I, thought, I, I actually thought we were showing a succession scene. I forgot we cut a trailer, so.
That, oh, gives yeah. you, that gives you a bigger right. uh, view of it. And, and you did say something backstage about Succession that I thought was kind of interesting. Um, most of us would recognize Brian Cox. I, mean, I know him. I'm not sure everybody would recognize well, him. Well, to me, he was the first Hannibal Lecter, and of course, the X-Men series. He, was, he played Stryker on several different occasions. Um, but you were saying something about, about Succession and, and the casting. I thought we, was kind we of interesting. We specifically, um, in casting that, I, I, I'm guessing mo there's no name Unless you were working in Hollywood, you wouldn't know any of the actors. They had all been in things. But we specifically didn't want to put um, feature actors in it, because I, I believe that TV historically has made stars. You know, and, and I think that we're good at um, f scouting talent, finding talent, and putting it out there. Um, if you think about who started in, in TV, you know, Robin Williams, uh, Tom Hanks, um, who uh, the cast of Game of Thrones, you know, they're all going on now to to be more careers. started in soap Moore. operas. A, a, a lot of people had their start there, and, and um, I think when you know when you do a show like Big Little Lies, which is great, and we have a, a star-studded cast, that's amazing. But I, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that we also can create stars, and I think. You know, when I show this pilot to people, they go, "Wow, it's a really great cast." You know, I'm like, "Yeah, well, that's what you know, that's what you're supposed to do is cast them with right. really good actors." Right. So we tried, um, you know, and, and the and the risk is in this environment where there's 500 shows, you know, the, it is easier to launch a show with uh, James Franco and Maggie uh, right. Gyllenhaal. You know, it, it's it's certainly easier to do it. So it's a little bit of a of a risk to see. You know, um, there's no. There's no name to kind of say, you know, watch this person act on mm -hmm. television. So we'll see. But um, I think it is historically something we've done well. Franco was here last year. He spoke at, at the campus, and I've never seen anybody drink that much water in that little time. <laughs> so I'm sure he, you're going to make me self-conscious. Sure, he upped right, your right, budget right. well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, there was lots, of, lots, lots of water. He is an interesting guy to say the least. Yeah. Um, so let's let's move on a little bit because I'm sure you know some of the critics look at Secession and they go. A nice cast, I don't know any of these folks, and some are saying, hey, that's pretty gutty on their part. Mm -hmm. How do you handle professional criticism like that? Mm. And, and not just professional criticism, but pop criticism as well. Well, they're kind of, they're kind of become one and the same. I mean, there's a whole industry of TV uh, commentary, I guess. It's half criticism, half, you know, opinions. Right. Um, right. You know, it's, it's a reality. We do read them. They do matter. Um, so when I got to HBO, I, had, I was working at a production company that was based at ABC. Nobody cared about reviews at all, mm -hmm. you know? But when I got to HBO, everybody knew every critic and every paper and what sort of things they liked and didn't like. And now I do, too, because we're very, very into reviews and I think when you are a subscription service and you're selling your brand, mm -hmm. you know, and you're asking people to pay um, every month, there is, the critical reviewer is, is part of the patina you're going for, you know, that right. it's well reviewed, you know, winning awards or at least, uh, I guess you say buzz, you know, that uh, kind sure. of uh, thing that you can't really quantify but you just know when something kind of hits in the culture, mm -hmm. you know. Um, <clears throat> it's it is things like, you know, Westworld did really well in the um, ratings. It did pretty well with the critics. When it ended up on Saturday Night Live, there was some sketch they had where somebody ended up being a robot. I don't even remember. But you go, oh, it's kind of permeating the culture. <laughs> when you're selling a subscription service, that sort of, that matters. Right. You know? Sure. I would, I would imagine so. Um, well, and, and HBO has been in the news a couple times in the last yes, few months. And, and, I'm aware. You know, I mean, we have, to, we have it's the elephant in the room. We have to talk yes, about yes. this. So, I mean, you know, for every story about you know remarkable numbers, you know, for mm -hmm. Game of Thrones, there's always talk about something else. For example, what's happening with this this unnamed uh, pitch that I believe the producers no, it's named Confederate. It is Confederate. Okay, yes. it is named. So now. the thing, it's been interesting with Confederate. It's been an interesting thing to watch. We we probably need to tell them what. Yeah, what I was going to say. So okay. Confederate. Uh, is 
the guys who created Game of Thrones, uh, David Benioff, whose uh, family is from Allentown, Benioff first, uh, David Benioff and Dan Weiss came to see me uh, with their writing partners on a new project, Nichelle Tramble and Malcolm Spellman, uh, African-American married couple. And their idea, what they wanted to examine was a divided society. And how they're going to do it is a physically divided, physically culturally divided uh, city. And it's an, it's an alternate, alternate history where they imagine the, the Civil War ended in a stalemate. So there is a physical wall erected at the Mason-Dixon line. Uh, the South, slavery remains legal in the South. In the North, it looks somewhat like where we are today. Um, and they're, they're talking to historians about, OK, if the Civil War was a draw, I'm not sure what would have happened to European history. They imagine California is more of a free state. I think Mexico would end up having more territory mm. in our Southwest. So they're, they're kind of imagining this alternative, alternative history. In the backdrop with the South has developed nuclear weapons, then the North has to deal with that, mm -hmm. similar to North and South Korea. And, and what's behind all of this is wanting to examine, you know, humans are in a very tribal people. And there's a very thin line between civility and chaos. And they kind of want to see what, you know, when that run, runs rampant, mm -hmm. what happens. The thing that got a lot of social media attention was the idea that they were going, that they were going to depict slavery. The problem, I think, and, and, and this is part of the problem, is the show hasn't been written. This is the, the, the pitch as described. I think what happens is people project what they think the show will be or might be or should be or could be, and they don't know, because the show doesn't exist, what the creators are thinking. I think there's some fear that by showing a, a slavery as a modern day institution that it's somehow an endorsement of that. And you know, obviously, I, I think there's a big difference between analyzing something and celebrating it. And nobody involved in the show thinks slavery is a good idea or thinks slavery should be legal. I, I mean, I would think that goes without saying, but apparently it doesn't. So um, this, this sort of thing has been mined for, for several generations, though. There was a story the other day that um, uh, the, uh, the owners of the Orpheum in, in Memphis, mm -hmm. which has become a sort of an art theater, um, had to uh, had to pull the Gone with the Wind. Gone with the Wind. Yeah. You know, there was and, and there was a professor from the university there who who thought that it was playing into into the culture. Yeah. But I think so. I think of other films that that have dealt with these issues um, quite you know quite dramatically over the years. Um, well, Blazing Saddles. I mean, how, I, how do you make Blazing Saddles today? I'm not sure. I'm not sure that you could. Um, but you know, it's interesting. If the, there's a show called um, *Handmaid's Tale* that's out, that I think right. is a really interesting show. Alternative history shows are nothing new. I mean, oh, we're not we're, Tarantino. We're, Tarantino's been doing that for several. Yeah, several it's times not now. like this is an original concept. Right. It's the creators that we believe in. But um, you know, *Handmaid's Tale* is about the subjugation of women. I, I don't think anybody involved in that thinks that's a good idea. But part of the reason for doing a show is to have that conversation, to show what could be possible, mm -hmm. to show you know, what humans are capable of. The thing that's interesting about their idea for how they want to depict slavery is it's not, you know, as Malcolm, one of the writers says, it's not whips and chains and plantations. It's not Gone with the Wind 2017. Mm -hmm. Their idea is the way that slavery, the way they imagine slavery um, kind of evolving is if you think about a minimum wage, African American working in Alabama in a minimum wage job, very little choice in where they work, not, uh, no access, not great access to public education or health care, you could argue that they don't enjoy equal protection from the police and that uh, with voter suppression, it's not necessarily um, an equal vote. Mm -hmm. Their idea is, that version of slavery is not that far off from some people's existence, and that's their point, is you can draw a direct line between you know, the events of our country from 150 years ago to today. And the more that that's done, I think, the better, that people realize that history is not leaving us. What it sounds like is they're, they're eliminating Jim Crow. To some extent. Uh, well, I, to ev in every extent, if, if, well, if they're maintain slavery, then eliminating Jim Crow, which unfortunately becomes part of the launch pad for how we understand the last yeah. 150 years of history. Yeah. So, it, but, but their point is the more it looks like today, mm -hmm. I think the more insidious it is right. and the more, um, 
the more it has to say about what we think of today as you know, basic freedoms. So is this a, a campaign about education? Is it a campaign about, you know, it, it, don't criticize us until you've seen the show? Well, it's, how, it's, do you, how do you handle something like this? I, you, I mean, there's not much. There's, you can't really have an argument about something that doesn't exist yet. And mm -hmm. you can't really have an argument about somebody's opinion on what something might be. Sure. You have to let the artists do what they're going to do. And that's what, you know, we support our artists and they're going to do what they're going to do. Um, I think everybody involved, I know they're thoughtful, smart, intelligent people. Um, so we'll just, you know, but this part of this also is in the, major, in the age of social media. The good thing and the bad thing about social media, I think, is that people who are historically disenfranchised have a voice. Mm -hmm. It's easy to express anger, and I think that's a good thing, but it also does encourage kind of uninformed uh, anger. You know, I, what I found with Confederate is people know they're angry, but they don't know why. Right. You know, and once you have a conversation with them, and, and our creators <laughs> have sat down with you know, people in the media who've been angry, and they go, well, no, here's what we're gonna do with the show, and they go, oh, well, that sounds interesting. Um, so it's, it's, it's easy to make a snap judgment, and f especially for something that's as complicated and sensitive as this. I, I don't think anybody's going to this thinking, oh, this is going to be easy. Right. Let's, you know, it's right. a very difficult right. thing to do, but that's, that's why we want to try it. I suppose from a business standpoint, you're kind of hoping for the Howard Stern effect, which is what, what made him a star wasn't the people that loved him, that listened to all three hours on WABC. It was the people that despised him, that listened to two hours to remember why. Well, I, I do think his ratings were unbelievable. Even Just before never, it's been created, uncharted. the show has you know generated think pieces and, and opinions, and I do think that is an important part of um, programming. You right. know, I, I don't want to I don't want to incite things just for the hell of it, but sure. I do think if they're going into this with the right point of view, um, I do think it's something that could be you know entertaining, but also kind of interesting, an interesting discussion for. The nation. But again, it's not like we haven't seen this. I mean, 12 Years a Slave was, yeah. you know, made, in, it made had in, was incredible box. Yeah. Um, and again, Tarantino. Tarantino's been yeah. doing this, not just with slavery, but with, with World War II. Well, I, I personally think that, you know, when you do a historical piece about slavery, like 12 Years a Slave or Django or Gone with the Wind, there's something about it being history where you can kind of keep it at arm's length and say, well, that's history. Unless you're, I, unless you know, you're a teacher. <laughs> yeah, well, but, you know, it, it's easier for, for someone to say, well, that was then, I don't, that doesn't affect me. Right. And I think what's interesting about looking at it in a you know, contemporary context is it does bring it closer to, to all of us. Absolutely, I, I'm just, to this day, I still have to, to tell students that Abraham Lincoln was, was not a vampire hunter. <laughs> you know, those kinds of things end up in essays, but yeah. they, they actually do. Um, um, and and let's, let's face it, it's kind of a, a, a strange twist on the Gone with the Wind thing that the first African American to win an Oscar was Hattie McDaniel mm -hmm. for that portrayal. So yeah. to have that film removed, so, and so it, it's, it does yeah. make for some interesting content. All right, let, let's, um, let's move away from the, the heavy. Let's get into some more light things. Um, it's hard, I, can, I have to imagine, it's hard not to be a fan. So when you know, you're trying to put on the presidential face, trying yeah. to have the president, as Aaron Sorkin would say, the presidential voice, right? Um, the actor or actress that you've always wanted to work. Well, here's what I'll, <laughs> Here's what I'll tell you, and this okay. will be cynical. There's an old saying, and I apologize because I do have family in, in the room, but there's an old saying, <laughs> show me the most beautiful woman in the world and I'll, sh I'll show you a guy who's tired of right. having sex with yeah, her. Yeah, yeah. Um, the thrill of meeting uh, actors is long, long gone yes. to me. <laughs> it's not, uh, it's fine, you know. Um, so, uh, but I, I have been very fortunate to work with very talented people and, you know, it's exciting until it's not. <laughs> until you're on long, long phone calls hearing somebody <laughs> right. tell you right. all of their problems with a certain show or a certain script or, you know, whatever. So, um, that, that, um, that excitement is, has long faded for me. But, but I have to imagine, too, at the same time, you've seen contracts from people that you just imagine were pills 
We're, what? We're, we're absolute pills, and you find out that they're actually darling, lovely people. Not many. <laughs> <laughs> not right, you want to scratch that from the recording? <laughs> this is not Casey Blas of, of, of HBO. He's some guy we found on the street talking yeah. about movies here. No, look, I think there's some. I think that there's some idea that you know actors are. Actors are artists, just like writers and just like directors. They're not, you know, they get in bad moods. They get temperament. It's not. They're, they're not a. They're humans, just like everybody else, and have the same kind of annoyances. And so, I think to some extent, especially with actors, we kind of put them over here when really they're just, you know, another very important artist in the in, in the piece. Uh, so, you know. To some extent, it can be more exciting to meet a talented writer. I was going to say, it has to be, I would think the directors and producers would be that much more difficult right. than Writers actors. really, you know, TV is a writer's medium. Right, um, right. So Absolutely. really they are the stars, you know, they're the ones who you kind of want to keep happy and get in the room. And, um, but listen, they're, it's hard, they're all, you know, they're all important pieces of the puzzle, so it's hard to say who's more important, but um, there, there is... Um, they're, they're all kind of equally important to the, to the whole thing. We have a couple budding screenwriters out here, I'm sure, all, all colleges do. A theme that you would like to see mined? A uh, theme? Uh, or, or an idea that you would like to see come to fruition? Geez, that's hard because I think I've seen, it, it, well, here's what I'll tell you about writing. Every, there, there's, every idea you think that's original is not. And it doesn't have to be. It's really your execution of the idea, you know? Um, I had somebody send me a, a, a thing in Facebook. I get a lot of Facebook like, oh, I have this idea. And she, it was a girl I knew from college. And she wrote me saying, oh, I just found out that my dad had a second family. And I have a brother who I never knew about. Do you think that's a good movie? And I, I was kind of like, you know, I can't tell you how many pitches I've heard <laughs> right. of that very same thing. But it's not. That's not the important thing. It's how you execute it. Mm. You know. So, <laughs> if someone pitches me a show, you know, set in college, I go, oh, well, all right. But what's what's the tone? What's the point? What's it about? You know, there's, there's execution is the key, not really the the setup. Sure. A writer comes off the street into your office, mm -hmm. knocks on the door, and says, "I want to work with you." Your fantasy. Who 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 does that? Well, I think Quentin Tarantino is, the, is probably the one person that hasn't done television yet. Okay. Um, Although his movies are on television every day. Yeah, so maybe that's enough. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. um, but I, you know, I will say I've been very, very fortunate to work with a lot of really, you know, Aaron Sorkin, David Simon, you know, Armando Iannucci, uh, Mike Judge, a lot of really, really amazing writers, so there's, there's very few who um, I haven't had the pleasure of at least meeting or talking to. We have time for one more. I'm going to throw it out to the audience a little bit. But, um, and I know this is not your cup of meat, but I remember the days when HBO was one step ahead of, of ESPN. You know, ESPN would do like underwater sport, mm -hmm. not water, but underwater sport. They had nothing, to, no programming. And HBO, their bread and butter was boxing. Um, I actually oversee HBO Sports, I'll have you know. Um, <laughs> but I will tell you, I don't, you know, there's a guy who runs sports, and my involvement is really more at the corporate level in terms of budgeting. Okay. I, uh, you know, he'll, he tells me who's fighting and things like that, but I, it's not my, uh, you know, uh, I don't know what he's talking about half the time. But, um, so my, my, my involvement is more from, you know, budget and scheduling and that sort of thing. Sure. And I don't get into the weeds in his, uh, his decisions regarding uh, no, I'm, I just find it I just find it fascinating. It's still, it's still a big uh, you know, huge again not as much as movies but some people get HBO for the boxing I mean we're, well, and real, and listen there's some great sports personalities I mean Brian Gumble is still doing his program absolutely and um, there have been several uh, the documentaries uh, mm -hmm. I've shown them in, cl in my classes for years Bill Simmons is working on a bunch of uh, documentaries for us so it, it's it's a big part of our you know, we have late, besides the series, we have movies. Um, we are, uh, it was, when it was announced, I thought, I did tell my mom, you better just know about this. We're doing, uh, Barry Levinson is doing a show about, a movie about Joe Paterno. 
Um, that may not be popular here, so you know, <laughs> you'll see it next spring and let me know. Um, but uh, we've got films, we've got Late Night, Bill Maher, John Oliver, we've got a, a documentary film group, uh, um, and uh, sports. So there's, there's a bunch of, and Cinemax, also I oversee Cinemax. Excellent. HBO covering the waterfront. I absolutely cannot see with this light, but can we bring the house lights up a little bit and have our microphone handlers um, look for some hands up? There's one here, I see one here, and one in the back over there. So whoever gets the mic first gets the first question. Hi, Casey. Hi there. Oh, sorry. Um, first off, thanks for coming back to the Lehigh Valley. It's appreciated. Uh, an opportunity to see what's going on on a different side of the world. I'm curious about, you, you started to speak about pitching, mm -hmm. and you must get pitched all the time, and you probably will tonight, for that matter. No, what's, I'm, I'm heading out the back. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's the process that happens from sort of a concept, how does it get to someone that makes a decision to invest in a project? Um, well, first of all, for something to get pitched to, to a network, or for, for us at least, there, there, are, there is, um, kind of pretty strict legal guidelines because uh, you have to be careful. Um, I mean, literally, if, if someone says, oh, my brother's friend has an idea, can they send you a script? We have to say no, unless they are represented by a, guild, a Writer's Guild signatory agent because what happens is, as I, what I was saying before, that there's, there's very few very, very original ideas. Someone will, if, if I were to take a script from an unrepresented writer about you know, someone whose mother-in-law moved in with them. Uh, what can happen, you, know, you read it to be polite, and generally speaking, you know, most scripts need work, and you say, not for us. Five years later, you know, a writer you know, who has an agent and has more credits and has more experience comes in and pitches a show about his mother-in-law moving in. The person who, rem hey, I sent my script in, that was my idea, you stole it. Um, so we'll get sued and have been sued. And so there's very strict guidelines about that kind of thing. Um, but generally speaking, what happens in, in a normal course of business is a writer is represented by an agent. Um, there's you know, several agencies in, in New York and Los Angeles. We have relationships with agents as development executives. They'll call us um, and say, do you know this writer? Do you know that writer? Um, we'll see plays if we like a play and find out who the playwright is. There's a lot of different ways in, but a writer is generally um, represented by an agent, and then they'll come in. At, at, my, at my point, I don't, I'm not in, in as many pitches as I used to be, but someone will come in, pitch an idea to a development executive, either in drama or comedy, and um, depending on, you know, we probably buy maybe 50 scripts a year in both comedy and drama. Um, depending on what we have in development, we'll either say, yeah, we'll give it a shot or not. More often than not, it's a pass, um, just because when you've got 50 shots, you want to make sure that it's something that you see potential in or it's a writer that you want to work with. Um, and then the development process, I mean, very quickly, is they pitch us an idea, they write an outline basically saying, here's how I see the first episode going. Um, I like the outline because you can figure out what the story is in that document, and then we say, you know, this looks good, go ahead and write the script. They'll turn the script into us. Our, the, the feedback we're giving is it's a little bit like being a magazine editor or, or a newspaper editor or a book editor. It's, you know, we kind of are saying to the writer, I see what you're trying to do here, but if you did this or if you did that or you try, you know, it's, it's our job to give them feedback on the script to get to get across the, the themes that they're trying to, uh, that they're trying to uh, illustrate. Um, and so we'll go through a couple rounds on the script, giving our feedback, and then at a certain point, we'll decide, do we want to make this or not make it? Um, we're, we probably average two to three pilots a year. Um, so it's not, we, we, we don't make, we don't buy a whole lot, relatively speaking, and make a whole lot because we're doing one night of programming on Sundays. Broadcast networks generally, you know, they're, they're filling six nights a week, so they have, they buy a lot more, they make a lot more, and they program a lot more. Um, but that is the development process in a very, very short, 
uh, description. And I have to assume too the, the, the legal process of, of choosing music is also just it's art it's arduous. I mean, I, I was well, mu music for a while. clearance is a whole other uh, that, department. But those clearances yeah. are just as uh, just as treacherous. From what well, I'm listening to you talk about, you know, the pitching process and the guild and working through. Well, if everybody is in guilds and represented, right. it's easy. Right. You know, at that point, it's just money with right. for the music. Um, it's it's sometimes trying to break in that it becomes a little bit difficult, but. If there are writers in the audience, people ask me advice, I can, I can preemptively give you advice, right? I mean, sure. are there, there's writers in the audience, I would imagine? I would imagine a few of my um, students may write something every I so would, often. My, my general advice is if you want to be a writer, you need to be around writers. Um, generally speaking, that means moving to Los Angeles. You could move to New York, but there's just more happening in Los Angeles. And when I say being around writers, that means being a production assistant on a show. Um, or working at an agency where agents represent writers. They're relatively easy jobs to get because they're entry level. Um, and it's really just kind of being around writers and being around other people who want to be writers. Um, I, I think the, the easiest, quickest way is you got to move to Los Angeles or New York. Um, and I know that's not possible for everybody, but that's, that's what I think you got to you have to do, you kind of have to commit to it. I just had this image of every Starbucks in LA with 12 writers that's what, taking that's, up all 12 tables. That's absolutely what it is. is uh, There's a hand there and one right, a couple in the middle here. I have a Yes, you mentioned Oh, uh, well, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. And we'll get to you next, I'm sorry. Um, you mentioned that being a kid, being a freedom mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, he's been into pitch. Uh, I, I sat down with him, I think within the last year, and he's been into pitch the drama folk. So, um, you know, he's he's a producer now, so um, he will, I'm sure, be pitching other things to us. Young lady behind, right there. We're trying to record this. So we'll get a mic. Yeah, Hi. Thanks. The biggest surprise for me in HBO News was the acquisition of Sesame Street. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit more about what was happening with yes. that and what the future is for children's programming? Yes. Um, that, the, 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 the Sesame Street deal was a couple of years ago, and that was when we were just going over the top, starting HBO Go, meaning we were going, that you could buy HBO, the consumer could buy us directly, not through a you know, Time Warner Cable, whoever, who is it, RCN here? I don't even know who the cable operator is. But we're going direct to consumer, and the idea with Sesame Street was, if we were going to go to direct to consumer, it would be a good idea to have some kids programming. Um, we haven't. There, there's going to be a spinoff from uh, from Sesame Street uh, that we're going to do. We haven't added a lot of children's programming around it because, frankly, we're still trying to figure out, in terms of expanding programming, where's the money best spent. There's a little bit of a debate whether it is family viewing, which would be you know, more like Disney movies or something like that, or actual kids' programs. Um, so we're still a little bit up in the air about that. But it was really just to have a little bit of a beachhead in kids. And it's actually a good, it was a good deal for, um, for Sesame Workshop, because we're basically funding the show and then giving it back to them after six months, I think. Um, so it was, it was just to have a presence in kids' programming. I have to imagine, too, from a subscriber standpoint, nothing motivates a consumer more than a child in your ear. That, that is, I mean, I see it with my kids in terms of the streaming services, uh, you know, going to Netflix and just, you know, finding junk to some extent, but they're finding stuff, right. you know. Right. We're here. I actually have a two-part question. I was wondering if you have an opinion about um, websites like the Script Lab and Stage 33 that offer paid services like pitch sessions and how important spec scripts are in the pitching? Um, I don't know the two, uh, I don't know the two services that you talk about, but generally speaking, uh, uh, paying for the experience, I, I'm not, again, I, I'd say you're better off moving to LA, moving to New York, and actually, you would be better off being a, the assistant at a production where there are actual writers working and establishing relationships with them than you would be having somebody randomly, I, I think, you know. Um, 
the, the, one, the one kind of paid thing that I think is worth it for people, it's kind of an a, a, a industry-wide thing that a lot of people do when they move to LA is there's a guy named Robert McKee. Do you know him? Robert McKee, Story Structure. Um, mm. He gives like a two-day seminar, and it is kind of helpful to, to go to one of those. It's about approaching script writing. Something like that makes sense. I'm a little bit skeptical about script lab and things like that. In terms of um, spec scripts, I think what's more important is original material. Um, it used to be when I first started that people would write Malcolm Middle uh, specs or Seinfeld specs. It's l people are more interested in original uh, works, whether it is an original pilot or original play or something like that. I think that's much more important than a spec script. Nina? Uh, hi, Casey. My name is Frank Petka. I just want to thank you, you for want to you? thank you for being oh, here. Oh, hi. Hi. Um, so I'm I produced a, a feature documentary about a story that happened about ten minutes uh, down the road here. Three guys living on a billboard in 1982, and I was fortunate enough to get it in front of the folks in your documentary division, um, and they passed on it. So I'm not here to pitch it, but my question is. Um, <coughs> Going to other networks or other distributors has been very challenging without representation, mm -hmm. and it's, it's almost impossible to get representation unless you're referred into it. So I just wanted to throw that out there and just ask your opinion on, or maybe suggestions on maybe how to go about getting representation. There is, it's one of those, it's a little bit of a, it's a frustrating thing about the industry, it's a catch-22, you can't get work until you get represented, and you can't get represented until you get work and everybody's got a different story about how they did it, but that's why I recommend working around people who are doing what you want to do. You know, if you were working on a production, again, those relationships that you make either at an agent, working at, a, at an agency or on a production, the relationships that you make with people who are represented, who have agents or agents assistants, or you know, uh, have a little bit of an inside track, that's, it is very hard to kind of break in from, from physically from outside, you know? Um, it's tough enough when you're living in Los Angeles or New York. It, it's, it's tough enough to do it. It's harder from outside, I think. So um, I, the only, you know, everybody's got a different story about how they did it. Um, sometimes it's persistence, sometimes it's, you know, a lucky break, um, but there's no one way. All right, there's a bloke over here, there's somebody I saw over here, but this gentleman over here is next. If you, if you, do, if you want to speak, go ahead and, and you know, identify yourself. Hello, my name is Sadie Sadiq, founder of Arrow Up, which is a media-based organization, locally owned. Um, and uh, my question for you is, um, you being uh, you know, in programming, which is uh, something that has a strong influence on the culture in today's society. How do you find a balance between actually doing good in communities and simultaneously making money? Um, well, uh, the, when, when you're looking at the programming slate, it's a little bit of it's a little bit of both. You know, you can't have. We did a little show that I loved. It was called Getting On, and it was about nurses in, um, it was in Long Beach. Uh, it was set in Long Beach, and it was kind of a working class hospital. Um, three, three women leads. Nobody watched the show. You know, um, nobody else would do a show basically about kind of forgotten elderly people dying in this ward and the women who take care of them. But it was, it had some, you know, it, it, was, it was very well done, and it had some, I guess I, I, I guess I couldn't convince myself it had some social merit to it, that it was showing a segment of society that I don't think anybody else would put on TV. I can't do, I, when people ask me about the comedy specifically, I say I do everything from getting on to ballers, which is a show about, you know, football players in Miami. Um, I can't do all getting on where it's all about, you know, small, uh, small shows about people you don't see on TV, and I can't do all shows about rich, you know, football players living the high life in Miami, but what I like to do is have a, uh, shows of all kinds of, that, that reach all kinds of people. So I guess that's the balance, is you can't do 
uh, because it is a business, you know, you can't do all programs that are for the social good. I like to think all of our shows, to some extent, are at least commenting on something that's happening in society. Um, but it's, it's a balancing act. Where, where else do you find a show about political corruption in Yonkers? Yes. I mean, honestly, that's, <laughs> exactly, yeah. that, that's yeah. pretty out there. Yeah. There was a, a hand over this way, and there was this gentleman over here who's been waiting patiently up in the second, in the balcony. Thank you, Casey, for coming uh, to, to Moravian College. We appreciate it so much. It's been great to hear from you. Um, my question is, has there ever been uh, any instances in which programming schedules have to be changed or modified um, just to avoid competition with other programs? Uh, one example that comes to my mind is when the, NBA, the 2017 NBA playoffs were going on and um, there was uh, WWE shows that were going on, but you could really see uh, significant uh, drops in viewership ratings. Mm -hmm. Is there any instances there, in which you have to do that? You know, it's funny. That's a great because question. It, 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 yes, you know, like when, when I think about the first quarter, you know, in Jan starting in January, you have the Golden Globes, you have uh, playoff games, you have the Super Bowl, you have the Academy Awards. Um, a lot of them happening on Sunday nights. When you think about the fall, you get um, the World Series, which always disrupt things. And this year, we didn't even think about how big the debates were going to be. I don't think anybody really predicted that. Um, in the spring, you have uh, the, the NBA playoffs. So in every quarter, there's something you're trying to avoid. We think about it, but we, once you get into it, you realize there's almost something. At this point, there's something every week, so it's hard to avoid it. So, you know, you kind of just, we think about it and sometimes we'll maybe start, we'll push the date, the start date a week or two to, to, to maybe not start on the United Academy Awards or not start on the night of the Super Bowl. Um, but you're always going to hit something. Um, but that's where w what I said earlier about a lot of our viewing now takes place off Sunday nights. Um, I think, you know, people are aware now that if they miss something, they know they can watch it in a repeat on Monday or they can watch it on Go or Now uh, or on demand. So when we think about ratings, I'm less concerned about what something does on Sunday night, although it's fun when Game of Thrones does something big on Sunday night. The, the more important thing is what it does. It's just, most of the viewing, like 90% of the viewing takes place within the first three to four weeks that something is made available. That's the number, the cum rating, the cumulative rating is the one I'm, I'm uh, most concerned about. Um, you know, a, a show like Insecure, which we aired this summer, was getting maybe one and a half million viewers on Sunday night, but over the course of the next few weeks of it being available and on different platforms, it's getting up to about 4.7 million. Um, that's the number I care about is the cumulative uh, number, because we don't sell advertising, so it, it doesn't matter when people watch it, just as long as they're watching it. We have time for uh, this question over here, one more after that, and then uh, uh, President Grigsby has to go back and pitch uh, uh, a thing he's, he's, got, he's got in development now about a, a mild-mannered college president and two wonderful dogs who fly and calculate mathematics and all things like that. Um, my question is, um, what is your relationship with each of the showrunners and what input, if any, do you have in the content of their productions? Um, good question, and they're related. Uh, each show and each showrunner is different. So um, some are very easy and like collaboration. Some are more difficult and kind of don't want to hear your ideas. Um, but I, I, you know, we, we, I, I like to think, and I think it's true, we're, we're pretty thoughtful about the feedback we give on scripts. And most relationships with showrunners end, end up being fairly collaborative. We respect them, they respect us. I'm never gonna tell somebody that they have to do something. Um, so generally speaking, it's good. And then, you know, the variable is people's personality and how much they wanna, you know, engage. But um, the, the input is fairly significant, I would say. I mean, we're involved in most decisions regarding a show from the, you know, the outline stage to writing and casting and direction. So um, we try to have a, a light touch, but we're definitely, you know, uh, overseeing all of it. And finally, right over here. Hi, 
Hello. Hi. Um, uh, you've mentioned a few paid streaming sites tonight, but HBO has been at the center of several controversies around piracy, specifically with regards to Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering um, if you could comment on how piracy has affected HBO and the programming. Well, this summer uh, there was a couple episodes that were available and, and clearly it didn't affect the ratings. Um, the, uh, there's episodes of Curb, uh, Your Enthusiasm, that's coming out in October that are available online. I, I don't want to minimize it because it is, you know, it is theft, you know, uh, of our intellectual property and it's not cheap. We spend a lot of money and spend a lot of time on these things, so it, it, is, it is theft of our property. But I think for the most part, most viewers prefer to watch the show on the platform in, in which it's meant to be. You have to be a really, really hardcore fan to watch something on a BitTorrent site, which a lot of times is like a rough cut or something that's not even fully finished. So I, to, to be honest with you, I think that it gets more media attention than it seems like more of an outsized problem than it actually is. Um, but it is an ongoing, it's an ongoing problem and it's the reality of our, of our business now that it, things are easier with streaming and uh, um, uh, with shows kind of premiering internationally, there are just more points at which something can be uh, pirated. It almost seems as ubiquitous as shoplifting. Yeah, I, it's, a, it's a reality, it's an annoyance, it, it costs us money, but you know, we're not gonna shut the store down because you know, somebody has shoplifted. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, Casey Bloy. Thank you. Of course, I want to thank everybody involved, Craig Underwood doing the technical side, Mike for everything, and Mike's team. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Casey. Thank you.